Well, I'm so grateful you decided to join us on this Tuesday night. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. We are grateful for the many blessings that we receive in life. Most of them go unacknowledged, unseen, behind the scenes. You bless us with so many things. And so we just take this opportunity to say thank you for them. And we pray that you would continue to open up our eyes to the love that you have for us. Inspire us that we might be a blessing to those around us. Bless us with your word today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to take a look at Ephesians chapter 5 today, verses 15 to 20. Now, this is actually a continuation of last week's lesson, which was also a continuation of the week before uh, lesson, and on and on and on, uh, because Paul's works are often cohesive units. Well, they always are cohesive units. They're meant to be read together, and where we get into some uh, trouble is when we as Christians, all sorts of shenanigans when we take passages out of their context, we can make the Bible say whatever we want it to say. So it's important that we understand what Paul was trying to tell us. And then once we understand what Paul was trying to tell us, then we come to the discovery of what it means for us. And so we must keep these passages in context. And so with that in mind, I'm going to just throw out a handful of things, remind you of Paul's kind of overarching argument is it's always again God blesses us okay now in particular God blesses us with salvation his gift of love for us why because one of the most important themes that we see in Paul is that it's for unity's sake there is neither Jew there is nor neither Greek we are all to be together there is we are something new we're brand new so these nationalistic boundaries, these religious boundaries, are not supposed to divide us anymore because Jesus Christ breaks down all of these walls. Therefore, <clears throat> okay, if you remember that uh, little symbol there, of course not the box, but the little uh, three dots means therefore. Therefore, be imitators. Of God, Be imitators of God. And that's kind of what we looked at last week in the beginning of chapter 15. He was showing us how to be imitators. In fact, he used my favorite word. We're going to see it, uh, that word again. Peripateo. To do a walk around. It's kind of that old Australian thing. You're doing a walk around. And you're supposed to walk around with God in your life. Wherever your journey may take you. It's not a directed walk. It's not a walk from point A to point B. It's just in the journeys of your life. Wherever you might be, whether it's in your household, or whether it's your next door neighbor, whether you're going to the synagogue, or whether you're going to the town next door, or whether you're working in the fields, wherever your walk around in life takes you, you take God with you. That way you can be an imitator of God. And so now we get with that in mind, <clears throat> because we've been blessed, because we're supposed to be unified, we should act in a way that's worthy of that. Be imi being imitators of God, because that's how we're going to be unified. And then he gets into verse 15. Therefore, be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Be full. It's kind of nice to say that backwards. Be full, with two L's, of care. Be full of care about how you live your life. So... Um, in the previous verses, he told us what to do. He's going to tell us some things about what we are to avoid. Be careful. Watch for the landmines that could take you down, that could keep you from walking around and representing God. You've got to represent your team, okay? In our case, the team is the family of God. And we want everybody to be a part of that family. So be careful how you live. How you walk around. Not as, and so, in fact, if you look at this word, verse 15, be careful then how you live. That word live really is that word that I've been hammering as my favorite. Peripateo. Peripateo. It is a Hebrew, a Hebrew word, a Greek word uh, that means that walk around. Be careful how you live. Not just walking from one point to the other point, not just living your faith from, for um, 
in the moments where you're out in public, wherever you might walk, be consistent with it. Be careful, though, of the landmines that might prevent you from living a fashion that's representative of God. Live as wise people. And the word that's used for wise is Sophia. We actually have a little girl in our congregation, Sophia. Her name means wisdom. So maybe you know somebody. It's wisdom. That's the Greek word for that. Live as wise pe people, Sophia. And Sophia. There you go. So be careful how you live. We go on. Making the most of time because the days of evil. Uh, you know what? A better translation of this, this is again verse 16. Redeeming the days. Redeeming your days. If you want to walk around, redeem the time. That means take advantage of it. Cash it in in a way that you use it faithfully. Okay? Redeem these days. Days. Take advantage of the opportunities that life presents you. Don't waste your days. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that every day has to be spent on doing something necessarily overly productive. It's okay if you want to take a day off and you want to go and watch some movies or play some video games. But be careful how you live. Don't let your whole life, you look back a month later and say, what have I done this month? Oh, I played video games every day. Well, nothing wrong with playing video games. All right? But has that been an actual faithful redemption of those days in a way that you were walking around in faith that was representing Jesus Christ to people around you? So we need to take advantage of the days that we have. Don't waste today. Because he goes on, redeem today because the days are evil. Ooh. Some Christians really fixate on this word. <laughs> So much so that they think about how evil the days are. Oh, we live in the worst days. Jesus is coming because this is the worst the world has ever been. That's bold, by the way. I dare you to try to live back in the days of Jesus 2,000 years ago. And then I dare you, double dare, dog dare you, to try to live 4,000 years ago. I think you come back home thinking, maybe we don't live in such a bad day after all. Our biggest problem is we have news that always presents just the bad stuff. And so it takes this much bad stuff and it makes it like this. Now, I will say this. We are quite unkind to each other. And that's got to stop. Because we need to redeem our day and live it in a way that is reflective in, uh, uh, of those who are called by Christ as imitators of Christ. We need to walk around in this love. So Paul doesn't fixate on this word evil. He just accepts it. The world is evil. People can't be evil. The, the world is evil. It's filled with evil things and stumbling blocks that would take us astray from God. True. I don't think it's more evil. It's just there. Paul just moves on, but some Christians fixate on this. So much so that say, yeah, the world is evil. We have to avoid those landmines. No. Paul wants us to walk around in this world, okay? You're supposed to walk around to mix this evil world. Not sit there and shore yourself up in a hermetically sealed church away from people. The world's evil. There's landmines out there. So live as wise people so you can identify those things, but walk around amidst it. Parapateo. Walk around amidst it. How else is the love of God supposed to be made known if you don't walk around in the world? Or if you sit here, oh, you're evil, and pointing out everybody's evil. That's not the point. You just walk around to be a representative of Christ, be an imitator of Christ. All right? This is what Paul is trying to tell us. So like I said, I'm concerned that some Christians fixate on this. Paul doesn't. He runs right over it. In fact, let me, let me read this kind of the way he says it, because it, it just goes quick. I'd be careful then how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making most of the time days because the days are evil. So don't be foolish or understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't fixate on this one word. Don't. Like I said, you hear this in many churches over and over again about how evil the world is, and they fixate on how evil everybody else is except for us faithful sitting here in church on Sunday. Then they've kind of missed Paul's point. Okay? They missed it. It's just a little point. Yeah, the world's evil. We know that. So what? But you still need to live your life as a faithful person. 
to represent Jesus Christ. So when you think of the evilness of the world, my concern is that religious people, Christians, pastors, preachers, use this as a manipulation to justify doing some rotten things and treating the world with just as much evil in return. Again, that's not Paul's point. You should rise above the evil of the world. Since the days are evil, which is accepted, so what? Rise above it. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Just don't give in to the shenanigans there. That's all. Instead, know God's will. So when these landmines come of you're being offered the opportunity to participate in some evil things, you just say, no, that's not me. Because you're doing what again? Peripateo. You're walking around as an imitator of God. Okay? You can't know him. But Paul goes on. Well, you can't know the will of God if you're stupid. Sometimes we Christians are acting in a very stupid way. And so he says, stop acting stupid. Stop getting drunk with wine. Because if you're drunk with wine, you're going to be too stupid to know what the will of God is. You know, so stop spending all that money to get drunk. For goodness sake, nothing wrong with a glass of wine. All right? He's not advocating uh, being a, uh, a teetotaler, he's just saying, don't allow these things to control you. Because remember, we need to keep a mind clear. We have to represent God. If you're going to a bar, go to a bar, that's fine. But remember, you're representing God at that bar because you're parapateo. You're walking around as an imitator of God wherever you might go, including the bar. So are you representing God in the bar? Are you being stupid and allowing yourself to be overtaken by the things of this world? That's what he's saying is. Because again, that's debauchery, he goes on to say. Rather, he goes on to say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So rather than being drunk all the time, be filled, not drunk, be filled with the Spirit. Huh. How am I going to do that? How do I, okay, spirit, now come. You know, there are actually some churches that teach you like there's a, a rhythm or, or a, a list of things that you have to do to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, it becomes almost a legalism. You know, do step A, step B, step C, step D, and, you know, if you're not, you did it wrong and you weren't sincere. And, you know, that's not what Paul is trying to say. He's, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with the things of the Spirit, okay? You are filled with the Spirit. Therefore, fill your life with things that are worthy of the Spirit. Walk around in the Spirit. So how do we parapateho? How do we walk around in the Holy Spirit? Okay, so let's, so walk around in the Spirit rather than filled with <clears throat> alcoholic spirits. Okay, so walk around in the Spirit. How do we do that? Well, Paul actually tells us. It's kind of cool. So don't get drunk with wine. That is debauchery. Debauchery, be filled with the Spirit as, here's how you do it, you sing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs amongst yourselves, making melody Oops, in your hearts. That is really beautiful. So how are you filled with the Holy Spirit? There's not a list of rules and regulations that you follow to get filled with the Spirit. Just sing music. That is reflective of the faith that we share. And I think he's talking more than literalistic music, although I think that's certainly a part of it. But there's an understanding that music is that extra dimension where, you know, we speak words, but music adds another dimension to it and brings a power and that emotion to it. We're supposed to reflect God in our lives. 
And so we make melody in our hearts. In other words, we are unified with each other. We sing harmonies and melodies that, that go together, that shows the world that we're one. And yes, the rest of the world, sure, they're struggling with the evils of the day. And that's why they need us to walk around in faith, singing beautiful melodies. So if you're sitting here and just pointing your finger all the time at all the people that are evil, you're not walking around in the life of God. We're supposed to sing a beautiful melody. People say, oh, that's the tune I need to hear. If you're angry all the time, and you're always pointing out how evil everybody is, and oh, we're in the last of days, how is that attractive to anybody? How is that melody bringing people to Jesus? Tisk tisk tisk. shame on you. Whoever comes to God because you say that? They need us singing a beautiful melody that is reflective of one who walks around in the Spirit. goes on, <laughs> verse 20. So we have a melody in our heart that is beautiful, and we walk around with it. It's a reflection of, of one who is an imitator of God. That beautiful melody, we're filled with the Spirit, rather than the debauchery of drunkenness and saying dumb things. And then, oh, verse 20, we give thanks. The, the, the word, I love the word here, it's the word, I'll spell it in English, Eucharist. You've heard this word in English, that that's basically a transliteration of the Greek word, Eucharisto, Eucharist, okay? To give thanks, give thanks. This is our reason for being, to sing melodies to give thanks, to acknowledge God. So when we walk around in the world, we're, we're offering them something better. Not our indictment, not our finger in their face. You know, this is what's wrong when you get and invest yourself into things of this world, whether it be the politics of this world or whatever it might be. We get this real judgmental attitude and we point our fingers at, at people who don't think the way we do. How is that reflective of the love of God that's in our heart? Eucharisto, we should be give thanks. We should be singing a beautiful melody because this is how we walk around in this world and give the world something better to listen to, something better to say. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the blessings of this day. Sure, we walk, we're walking around an evil world, but that's not our fixation, our focus. We can walk around no matter what the circumstances of life are. That's what Paul's point is. Don't get fixated on the evilness of this day. Rather, we fixate our lives upon the beautiful melody that the Spirit wants to sing in our hearts. The joy that we can give. That even despite the things and the shenanigans that go on in this world. There's good. And there's so much to give thanks for. And so let us walk around in this life as representatives, as imitators of God, that this melody might be heard, that this thanksgiving might be spoken. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to leave this place today with a beautiful melody in your heart with thanksgiving on your lips. We ask this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.